There was a whole lot of umming and eyeing at how exactly I should start this video. You know, I feel as though a lot of good retrospectives of Halo open with an action field montage set to the legendary soundtrack. And I did consider it heavily, but I don't think it feels appropriate for me. The overwhelming response to the Mass Effect 2 video was genuinely insane. And to someone who, at the time of writing, has only just about scratched the 50 subscriber mark, to have over 50 times the amount of people watch my video, to have dozens of comments and likes and all around appreciation, with some people even going above and beyond to watch all three and a half hours of this behemoth of a video, words truly can't express my gratitude for you people, and I thank each and every one of you. You know, this may be the cheesiest sounding thing you've ever heard in your life, but all of you out there who watch these videos are, like Mass Effect and Halo, legendary. Well, let's do a montage anyway. In 2001, the big boys at the gaming table were Sony and Nintendo. Sega had more or less been pushed out after two troubled consoles back to back, and Microsoft was really struggling to make a splash with successes few and far between. The original Xbox was a massive machine. If dropped from the top of the Eiffel Tower, it was capable of causing a magnitude 7 earthquake in Osaka, and few developers seemed especially interested in the device as a whole. Included in that is now household name Bungie. Prior to their involvement in the Destiny games, and prior even to the Halo games, they were working on what seems to be some sort of real-time strategy game for Apple computers before transitioning to creating a first-person shooter with the tagline, Combat Evolved. As far as taglines go, it's admittedly a pretty dumb sounding one. I mean, what does it even mean to evolve combat? First person shooters had existed for almost 10 years by this point, and with games like GoldenEye and Half-Life already out, and in fully realised actual 3D as opposed to the creative workarounds used by id, the title sounds pretentious. But, and I mean this honestly, the title is absurdly appropriate in consideration to this particular game, as it's the earliest example of a game I'm aware of to really make each and every weapon in your arsenal not only feel like it has its place and purpose, but to thematically match its ambitious story and have an appropriately eerie atmosphere to the game as a whole, which makes everything feel like such a step up in terms of both gameplay and game feel compared to many of Halo's predecessors and contemporaries. I will go into a lot, lot more detail of the gameplay and atmosphere of the game later on, but I think it's more thematic to get introduced to how the game starts to get a better understanding of how the gameplay ties in to what is set up by the first couple of levels. The object we found, I'm gonna try and land the autumn on it. The Pillar of Autumn is the name of Halo Combat Evolve's first level, and is also the name of the gigantic spaceship that we see in the opening cutscene approaching some sort of strange ring-like structure floating through space. As it is, we are given next to no context as to what exactly this ship or this ring are all about at this point, and honestly, throughout the game they do what they can to leave things feeling very mysterious for the most part. By now, you've probably noticed that this game looks... ancient. And many may be wondering why exactly I'm not using the remastered version of the game here like I did for Mass Effect 1 and 2. Well, I am. I am playing on the Master Chief Collection version of the game here, which is effectively an updated and fixed version of the Xbox 360 Anniversary Edition of the game, a game that was in many ways controversial for its numerous downgrades and issues, and importantly, for its lackluster quote-unquote remastered graphics that were in many ways an antithesis to the original game design. As such, I make this disclaimer once and only once. I am playing the original graphics simply because I enjoy them more than the remastered graphics, but if you yourself ever want to play Halo on a newer Xbox console or on PC, there are some updated graphics available, and they are relatively impressive for what they are, being available with just the push of one button mid-game. They're just not to my taste. Anyway, with the graphical tangent over, we can now witness the beginning of the icon himself, Master Chief, as he emerges from cryostasis and undergoes a brief tutorial that segues nicely into another tangent. This game makes sure to inform you how to look around in all directions with the same input method, that being the right analogue stick on the original Xbox. And while this may seem trivial, obvious, logical, and unnecessary to inform people of, at the time, people were used to games like Goldeneye with its quirky control scheme, or to play first person games just with keyboard and mouse. Admittedly, I did actually play this with keyboard and mouse because I just find it more natural personally, but at the time this was not only not an option, but its control scheme was actually the one considered quirky. I'm not 100% certain that it was necessarily the first game ever to incorporate what would become the industry standard control scheme, and I won't claim that it is, but I do know for certain that it helped to popularise the idea of using the left stick to move around and the right stick to look around. Hence, the game prioritises making sure that newer players are familiar with 
with how this works, even though anyone picking it up today and playing it probably won't even remember this scene, because it is so utterly insignificant to your modern gamer, so much so that it doesn't even play on higher difficulties. Soon thereafter, the Pillar of Autumn finds itself under attack from a strange alien army, and one that seems particularly familiar to the captain of this ship, a man named Captain Keys, whom we quickly rush off to meet with after watching the tutorial guide get obliterated. Prior to Chief waking up, there was a cutscene introducing Keys, as well as another gentleman named Sergeant Johnson and an AI woman named Cortana. This ragtag crew of characters, in addition to Master Chief and a woman who we never actually see on screen but goes by the name of Fauxhammer, more or less make up our entire cast of characters for the entirety of this first game. Keys is a straight-edged, no-nonsense military guy and is portrayed as a competent and respected leader. Johnson is more down-to-earth military guy and is more over-the-top comedic and fun. Cortana is a bit of a know-it-all, not that that's a bad thing, as she ends up serving well to guide Chief and the player through what's going on and provide necessary information and exposition while still appearing friendly, snarky and approachable for a holographic purple lady. Fauxhammer is just a pilot who serves as level transitions. She doesn't have much personality beyond clearly liking her job and wanting to help, and Chief is stoic, cold and laser focused on his mission given to him by Keys. A full evacuation order for the ship is called, set to land the escape pods on this gigantic ring and to rendezvous and find a way to evade the aliens, known as the Covenant, or to die trying. Keys gives us Cortana's AI chip to speak and interface with Chief directly, as well as his trusty pistol before leaving us to make our way off the ship while trying to save as many marines as possible. The first level is very claustrophobic and typical of games of the era, a bunch of corridors and small rooms with enemies at the end of them. You've seen rooms like this in dozens of games, and if you've played all the shooters, then you're very familiar with this setup, as it is a solid 75% plus of level design in games like Doom and Half-Life. It's a serviceable, enjoyable level that acquaints you further with the controls and gives you a few weapons to try. The trusty pistol emerges rapidly to be an absurdly powerful weapon, just genuinely way too strong and well-rounded in most situations. It's also not long until stumbling across the iconic assault rifle, which is more of a tool used in tandem with another weapon to allow for quick and reliable damage to strip the shields of or to finish off a target, but isn't usually the best for killing someone outright. We also find frag grenades, which function an awful lot like your typical grenade, and are really the bread and butter of multiplayer combat in Halo by being one of the most sad satisfying components in gameplay, as well as finding that we were able to pick up and wield the Covenant's weaponry. There's not a huge amount in this first level, but the Plasma Pistol and Plasma Rifle are both present and initially seem to be really quite weak, but do indeed have their own uses if you get used to them. As I said, I'll save gameplay talk for later, so we'll just press on and make our way to the escape pods. I wish I had more to say about this first level, but honestly there's not a lot of story to speak of and the gameplay is very level 1. It's not the hardest by any means and it's not the most interesting to look at. As the level concludes, Master Chief gets into an escape pod with a bunch of soldiers and is jettisoned onto the ring. Due to not wearing his seatbelt, we can only assume he ping-ponged around the interior, smushing all of his allies into paste, because upon landing on the ring we awake to find all of them thoroughly deceased. But what's more important is that this place is absolutely massive. Wide-stretching plains, mountains, a blue sky, and a wide canyon that wouldn't look amiss on Earth or any other Earth-like planet are all present on this strange metal ring, but so are these cold and grey metallic structures such as this small bridge we have to make our way across. It's a somewhat odd juxtaposition, but it's also a really unique and endearing art style that immediately gives you this feeling of isolation and loneliness from how desolate yet strangely alive this place feels. That is, until making our way up the hill and coming face to face with more Covenant troops. By this point, we're pretty adept at taking them out, and we even have a lot more room to manoeuvre around compared to that of the first level. Pass on over the ridge and get blinded once more by the majesty of this ring. Up ahead, we find some of our friends hanging out on a strange structure and we protect them from a few waves of incoming baddies. The marines don't particularly help out a whole lot, and on higher difficulties I can all but guarantee they're going to die at some point along the way, as will most of the marines that fight alongside you at any point in the game. Cheap is a seven foot tall monster of a man in a suit of armour that costs more than most spaceships. The average marine is probably around 6 foot and in armour that doesn't even cover their faces. They're very fragile and so Cortana suggests that we use a warthog dropped off by Fohammer to drive around the local area and, as we did with these marines, save anyone and everyone we can find. And yes, the car is called a Warthog. The ship Fohammer flies in is called a Pelican. All of the human vehicles in Halo are named after some sort of animal, and most of the Covenant vehicles have some kind of ghostly name associated with them. This is just accepted as standard fact, and is never questioned, although some do certainly like to call the Warthog a Puma instead. We drive down through a cave that, according to Cortana, is not in actual formation. This information both shocks and astounds me. I could have sworn this big metal chamber was caused by wind erosion, but she is probably smarter than me so I shall trust in her sound judgment. Judgment, drive on down doing sick jumps, kill some more aliens and activate the bridge. After emerging on the other side of this so-called unnatural cave, we're basically given the option of one of three places to visit next. This is what we call the illusion of choice, as sooner or later I will have to visit all three of these locations, but I can choose the order in which to tackle them. I start off with the closest
closest and probably intended one, clear it out of Covenant forces and rescue the marines hiding underground. As Fohammer shows up to collect the fellas, she informs us of two more locations where drop pods landed, and we go to find any more survivors. Along the way, my gunner tragically passes away due to faulty manufacturing from the Warthog Company. Pretty sure the suspension was all off here. And so these marines actually all end up hopping on board and gunning for me as we attend the other survivors. I also find myself a sniper rifle and get to have a bit of fun picking off the Covenant at range as we clear the area ready for Fohammer to come on in and save the marines. Albeit with us receiving the terrible news that Captain Keyes has been keysnapped by the Covenant and being held aboard one of their ships named the Truth and Reconciliation. So, as Fohammer picks us up, we fly off to the desert with Sergeant Johnson and engage our first stealth mission with our woefully unsilent sniper rifle. Pick them off under cover of darkness, advance up the ridge and even find ourselves an invisibility power-up. At the base of the ship is a large gravity lift that will allow us to effectively voluntarily get abducted, but it is heavily guarded by several waves of Covenant forces of all shapes and sizes. Turrets, little guys, shield guys, big guys and even bigger guys are all accounted for, but they are no match for the might of the Master Chief and his marine friends. Once the area is cleared, I step onto the platform and get ready to be raised into the air and board the ship, where I'm sure there will be absolutely no enemies waiting for us whatsoever. And now that we've had a look at a variety of weapons, a bit of vehicling around and all of the enemy varieties to speak of, I think now is as good a time as any to take a look at the gameplay and showcase how and why it works so well. <laughs> Let's start with the variety of enemies available to face in this game. As I just said, they come in all shapes and sizes. Little guys, shield guys, big guys and bigger guys. And that seems like an appropriate order within which to tackle them. The little guys are known as grunts. And while they appear small in many ways, they are in fact the size of an average human, which would be worrying if they weren't so fragile. One headshot from the pistol eliminates these guys and they're typically seen carrying lightweight weaponry, but can on occasion carry artillery weapons capable of causing chaos. Additionally, they are what I would consider quite grenade friendly, and are willing to use their grenades to eliminate the chief even at their own personal risk. These are your typical cannon fodder enemies, used to pad out the numbers without overwhelming the player, or even really adding too much difficulty to an encounter. Accompanying their comparatively diminutive stature is their adorably high-pitched voice and cowardly tendencies. If you kill one of the big guys in the presence of a grunt, they will run away screaming with their arms in the air, at least until they calm down and or reach safety, at which point they will give up on surrendering and try once again to take you down. Next up are the other fairly short enemies, the Jackals, equipped also with lightweight weaponry, but also with the addition of a plasma shield that protects them from the front. Trying to shoot them, especially with lower power or inaccurate weapons, will often just damage the shield which, while it will eventually take enough damage to break, is ultimately a waste of time and ammunition. Fortunately, they are vulnerable to behind, at least according to my script, and about as fragile as the grunts are. A couple punches or a single shot to the head will usually take them out if you're able to outmaneuver them and deal with them quickly. Alternatively, you can try aiming at their weapon poking out to the side of the shield. If you manage to land a shot on their hand, they will recoil in pain and expose their entire chest and face to you, allowing you to quickly follow up with a shot to the head. In the heat of battle, this can sometimes be tricky to do and focus on, but it rewards good shooting with an extremely satisfying 1-2 combo to take down an otherwise ammo-hungry enemy. The big guys are known as elites, and they are both the most iconic and most versatile enemy type in the game, being able to wield any weapon used by the grunts or jackals, including grenades, and also including their iconic energy sword that can be used to instantly kill the player should they get the drop on you. The colour of their armour typically dictates their rank, as well as how tough you can expect that guy to be. A blue one is relatively manageable and can be dealt with easily with any weaponry, but the few golden ones you come across can even take multiple sniper shots without flinching. This is all assuming that they aren't invisible in the first place, which can make them even harder to deal with as they won't even appear on your radar. Finally, we have the big blue guys we just met at the bottom of the grav lift, the Hunters. The elites do not mess around by any means, but the Hunters are downright terrifying to inexperienced players, boasting a weapon that can one-shot you at range and a charge attack that can one-shot you in close quarters. This, in addition to their bulky armour that renders them nigh invulnerable to most conventional weaponry and makes them take an absolute age to whittle down the health bars of, can make the Hunters, whom you always face two of, never just the one, a very dangerous threat. Fortunately, they have a glaring weak point that isn't their head. If you're able to get behind a hunter, be it by getting it to lose track of you or by moving out of the way of its charge attack, you can get to see its yucky orange back. Simply shoot it once with a pistol or a high calibre of weaponry and boom, dead hunter. 
In a vacuum, this all presents a variety of easy to execute strategies that make dealing with any of the covenants seem pretty simplistic. They all fire projectiles that allow you to dodge them, telegraph things like grenade throws, and tend to dodge your grenade throws in turn. It all seems very manageable on paper, but the reality of a hectic gunfight with dozens of grunts and jackals supported by a few elites in the back, some turret placements shooting you down, and surviving all of this, only to be greeted by some friendly hunters to top it all off, make the gameplay loop satisfying and high adrenaline as you weave in your intricate knowledge of the enemy's weaknesses, strengths, and tactics to eliminate the threat they pose without dying. The reality of it is that it can be genuinely quite challenging in a fun way, especially if you're trying to deal with encounters quickly, making for an incredibly fun set of enemies to go up against in each level. The Covenant do have their own weapons and vehicles as well, but rather than adding more to this chapter, I'd rather save them and talk about them and the rest of the weapons and gameplay in our next segment. I don't keep it loaded, son. You'll have to find ammo as you go. Halo Combat Evolved features eight different weapons that can be held in the player's hand, in addition to two types of grenades, two types of mounted turret, and four controllable vehicles, as well as the aforementioned energy sword that is unusable by the player and only appears on elites. I will also state it here in case someone tries to get smarmy that the multiplayer includes an additional two weapons and an additional vehicle, but I am not talking about the multiplayer yet, so shut up. I already ran through the pistol and the assault rifle a little bit, so let's cover them first and let's make it brief. The pistol is a surprisingly high power and incredibly accurate semi automatic weapon that allows you to scope in. It takes out grunts and jackals in one shot, can even take out hunters in one shot, and deals a lot of damage to elites. By all accounts this is the best weapon in the game, and it and its ammo are plentiful, in addition to being very satisfying and fun to use. Assault rifles in most games serve as the all-around option that typically shape the game's weapon balancing around them, by laying down suppressive fire due to one-shot headshots. Halo instead opts to make it a low damage weapon that can't one-shot anything, and is inaccurate to boot. That said, it still serves as a great around option because while it won't be the biggest threat that you have in your arsenal, it pairs well with just about every other weapon in the game by setting enemies up to be taken out quickly, or by using its absurd ammo count to eliminate smaller targets while saving more important ammo for the bigger threats. The shotgun is a shotgun. High damage, low range, longer reload. The key part of that is the high damage, as this thing tears through enemies and is about the most common weapon type that can one-shot elites. This kind of versatility and devastation in something that is usually plentifully abundant in ammo in the levels that appears in makes it a winner in my book, although it sadly doesn't appear in too many outside of easy difficulty. The sniper rifle is a bit finicky as it logically requires good accuracy. That said, you are rewarded with one-shot kills on elites from angles that they can't possibly begin to fathom. Equipped with two levels of scope allowing for insane ranges and night vision too, the sniper is the best weapon in the game for… or sniping obviously. Does anything need to be said other than rocket launcher, instant kills, area of effect, high damage, and terrible ammo count and incredibly rare? I love rocket launchers and blowing stuff up, and I suspect that you do too, especially one as absurd and bulky as this bad boy, and it only loses a few points in my eyes due to its scarcity. Our first Covenant weapon is the Plasma Rifle. High rate of fire, travel time on its shots, a distinctively alien appearance, and great shield stripping capabilities. This weapon is very odd, and functions distinctly well in medium ranges, specifically with its ability to slow down and stun elites who take enough shots from it. It's a bit weird and gimmicky, and in all honesty it's probably the weakest weapon in the game, albeit with a bit of a question mark. I would certainly tend not to use it, but like its human assault rifle counterpart, it is a great combo tool and can certainly be satisfying in many situations. The plasma pistol, however, well Halo just gets pistols, men. The plasma pistol may appear useless at first glance, and if you fire it like its human counterpart and use it as a semi-automatic weapon, then in all honesty it is pretty bad. But if you hold the weapon down, it instead charges up into a devastating blob with slight heat-seeking capabilities that unleashes an electromagnetic pulse on enemies to immediately strip away the enemy's shields and instantly allow for a follow-up with literally any other weapon in the game. In fact, while I just called it useless, its non-charge attack isn't even that bad when you get used it, and ultimately this weapon is a must-have if you like killing things quickly. The Needler is visually just amazing, and a very iconic and beloved gun in the franchise. Fully automatic, with some light homing qualities for its projectiles, it already on paper sounds like a decent utility weapon that can keep enemies at bay by turning them into glowing hedgehogs, and then the needles explode, dealing massive damage to enemies whom they are stuck inside of, and potentially setting off chain reactions with grenades on the floor. This thing is gorgeous, and very satisfying, but isn't quite as abundant as the other Covenant weapons, and to me is a little bit less satisfying than a plasma pistol combo. 
As for grenades, however, fragmentation grenades are the human one, and they get thrown, roll or bounce around a bit and then explode after a set time. If you need to kill something at a distance, it's good. If you need to separate a group of enemies and have them dive out of the way, then it's good. And if you need to get a bit of mobility by bouncing on the explosion, well, all around it's really good and effective against unshielded enemies especially, making it a very useful and enjoyable part of the arsenal. And with some levels being abundant with them, it is never a bad time to throw a grenade. The Covenant gets a slightly more fun grenade in my opinion however, as the Plasma Grenade, or the Sticky Grenade as I called them when I was younger, are, well you can probably deduce from that that they are sticky. If it hits an enemy or a vehicle, it sticks, dealing massive damage to them and even killing elites instantly, but with a smaller explosion radius than the frag grenades, making them a bit more precise and finicky. Now do bear in mind that you can only ever have two weapons on you at any given moment, so sometimes, sacrifices have to be made. You may want to hold on to your depleted rocket launcher in case you find more rockets down the road, but maybe that plasma rifle will be better for the time being. Now we've already been introduced to the Warthog. It's a jeep with a turret on the back and space in the passenger seat for someone to sit and shoot out of. All terrain, fast pace, lightweight and an absolute joy to drive. Later on we will be introduced to and become well acquainted with the Scorpion. It's a tank. I'm not sure much else needs to be said really, it's a slow beast, but it absolutely gets the job done. The Covenant also get a couple of vehicles in the form of the Ghost and the Banshee. The Ghost is a lightweight and zippy vehicle that leaves its driver heavily exposed while allowing the driver to fire two plasma cannons mounted to the front. It does a lot of damage and is very fun to run enemies over with, and of course the Chief can drive it if he finds it, making stealing one a very fun strategy for people who want to go fast. The Banshee on the other hand is scarcely available, as it's basically a small scale aeroplane that constantly moves forward and allows its pilot unrestricted flight. As it would obviously break a lot of levels if it was always available, it doesn't show up much, but it makes a huge impact when it does. And finally a quick look at the multiplayer exclusive weaponry in the Flamethrower, Fuel Rod and Rocket Hog. The Fuel Rod is actually used by some enemies in the game, namely Grunts and Hunters, but you never get to use it yourself, it always blows up. These weapons are all fun in their own niches, but not worth talking about much here as they aren't in the campaign. The cover the Covenant also have their own variant of tank called the Wraith. It fires big glowy artillery style shots that are very scary, so don't get hit by them. Sadly, it cannot be piloted even in multiplayer however. It should be noted that vehicles are very durable except for the very fragile Covenant vehicles, which are susceptible to being destroyed outright especially from explosions, making using them potentially quite dangerous even if their firepower is usually more convenient. In comparison, human vehicles are completely impervious to all damage and will work no matter what you do to them, though you and your buddies will still take damage whilst inside. Speaking of damage, it is split across two different health bars. Firstly, you will take damage to your shields, which function similarly to elite shields. It's stripped away over time from firepower, but avoiding damage for a few seconds will cause it to start regenerating. Once your shields are down, if you continue taking damage you will start losing health, which can only be restored using medkits found in levels. This makes shield maintenance a very integral part of the gameplay and something you should use well by tracking enemy movements. Fortunately, enemy movements are largely explained to you using the handy dandy on-screen radar that not only gives decent approximations as to their whereabouts, but also lets you know when the area is clear due to the, you know, absence of red dots. Be careful however as invisible enemies don't appear on the radar, so it's sometimes not worth letting your guard down completely. And before we move on, I have one last sort of weapon I would like to talk about. I've alluded to it already in regards to comboing with other weapons, but this one may perhaps be the most powerful weapon of them all, your own two hands. Meleeing is absolutely devastating and is capable of killing most enemies in like 3 or 4 hits tops. Using it in tandem with your weapons is great, as long as you remember the risks of getting that close to certain enemies, and also bear in mind that bigger and bulkier weapons tend to have bigger and bulkier melee attacks, or spikier in the case of the Needler. Hitting something can be your greatest asset when used wisely on stun targets or those stripped of their shields, and hitting something in the back is a guaranteed kill, even on the hardiest of elites or the sleepiest of grunts. There's also the standard movement, no sprint, but crouching and jumping are available and while I wouldn't say this game has the most fluid movement ever by any means, traversing the levels is relatively quick and feels satisfying by giving you the agency to make your own parkour a lot of the time. The gameplay is just downright satisfying, fun, and has aged extremely well. I love the combat in Halo and while future games in the franchise may have arguably improved upon the formula for 2001, while well, I think we can all agree that this game was well and truly deserving of the tagline, Combat Evolved. I found Captain Keys. He's being held on a Covenant cruiser. Now that we're acquainted with our full arsenal of weaponry, and the enemies of whom we shall smite them with, we and a ragtag team of fellas arrive on board the Truth and Reconciliation on our top secret stealth mission to rescue Keys. I'm fairly certain that the Covenant can't have possibly seen this coming, and probably didn't notice the commotion on the ground at all, so we should be safe here. 
Evidently, my assessment could not have been more wrong, and Covenant Falls is that pouring in our location with various energy sword wielding elites sneaking in amongst the fodder to try and take out my friends. Admittedly, I did a terrible job of keeping the boys alive here, and by the time our final hurdle arrives, a duo of hunters, I am left with but one boy at my side. Miraculously, he survived the encounter, and he and I go on to do great things together as we press on ahead into the next room full of enemies who probably know exactly where we are and what our intentions are. We progress into a hangar and take out wave after wave of enemies, and go into yet another corridor-based area as we advance onto the prisons and rescue keys. It is there that he explains to us that the reason the game is called Halo is because this big ring we are on it's called Halo, and the Covenant seem to believe that controlling Halo is the key to winning the war against humanity. Ergo, we need to find the way to control Halo and stop the Covenant from using it. But first, we need to evacuate the ship, and Captain Keyes is oddly confident that he can pilot one of the Covenant's weird horseshoe-shaped ships, which he uses to absolutely annihilate a couple of hunters. We need to beat the Covenant to Halo's control room. The hunt for Halo's controls begin with locating a map that Cortana has pinpointed as being on an island. The Covenant call the map the Silent Cartographer, and it is our job to locate it. The opening set piece to this level is honestly incredible, with an amazing action-packed fight scene on a beach that feels so full of life, with a large number of enemies and allies all pressing forward with constant gunfire and explosions. It just feels so dang heroic, while also having such little cover that it puts a few skills to the test, making it satisfying to overcome. There's nothing for us out in the water, so it's wise to just follow orders and get in the warthog, taking a couple of marines with us and adventuring into the first building we come across. Unfortunately, the doors are closed by the elites before we're able to make any progress into this building, although this does at least imply that this is somewhere we probably want to be. Gotta get those doors open first though, so we hop back in the hog and follow the beach to the next little inlet, which is a small canyon path leading to a big dish where we fight some hunters. Beyond that, another building where we fight yet more hunters and carry on through to find a button that opens up that door. On our escape after fighting off some invisible elites. Cortana informs that a pelican has kindly dropped off some supplies for us that should be helpful against bigger enemies like hunters. After backtracking a bit to our car and driving up the beach further, we find this pelican crash landed on the beach with a healthy supply of rocket launchers available to us. Thanks to this kind donation and acquiring some new friends due to our previous ones dying, I am quickly able to return to the original building and drive the warthog into a location that a warthog simply doesn't belong, getting it wedged along the way. Continuing via the intended method, on foot, we watch as Master Chief reveals his ways as a heinous litterer, and continue down through several unaware enemies using all of our expertise and a bit of invisibility we find on the floor, to make our way pretty easily to the silent cartographer. Cortana studies the schematics and determines the exact location of the control room, passing the information along to Fohammer as I make my escape. Fortunately for us, the rocket launcher makes short work of almost every threat conceivable here and, with the exception of my self-imposed problem of this stupid warthog stuck in the door, there are little to no threats posed by anything as we return to Fohammer and leave the island. The silent cartographer, as far as levels go, is pretty dang perfect. If you know what you're doing, you can just avoid all the optional stuff, immediately unlocking the door and making your way to the map using a carefully executed jump. It's a real speedrunner's dream, in addition to being a really fun level to play casually due to its great set pieces and fantastic almost open world layout. And it progresses the story. With Foham's valid concerns about the coordinates being underground being heard and promptly ignored by Cortana, who swears that this should be an easy ride for the most part. The next level loads up, appropriately titled Assault on the Control Room, and we are indeed dropped off by Fohammer into an underground complex. More corridor gaming continues and what is a stark contrast to the previous level, as this level is an absurdly linear experience. Corridors and bridges connect very, very samey rooms that are all incredibly similar to one another. There are arrows and lights to help you navigate your way, which are even more prominent in the remastered graphics, but fortunately, as long as you recall where you came from, navigation isn't too big of an issue. Eventually, after using an elevator to get down to ground level, it opens up into a massive canyon that was kind of teased earlier on the bridges. This is our first real introduction to the wraiths and the ghosts, and we get to equip ourselves with rockets and snipers to make taking out these enemies easier. Unfortunately, the marines in this area all went and died on me, so I finish everything off with the ghost. With that area done, we do a small jump into an area of- oh my lord, that's a tank. The scorpion- it annihilates everything. There's really nothing to talk about here because while this thing is pretty slow, it allows the user to outgun more or less anything and makes this bit just a really satisfying and fun area. Underground, across a bridge, back above ground through more canyon, down a little ridge to where we find some more marines and, unfortunately, a roadblock. Now I may have been able to finagle the warthog into an area it didn't belong earlier, but the scorpion is a bit more rigid and unwavering, so I don't even bother and just continue on foot. 
Fortunately, it's not much further ahead at the end of the next canyon, but we have to go back indoors anyway. There's not a whole lot of story to talk about at this point, so we'll just carry on ahead, gunning down Covenant forces until arriving at the control room, located in a large pyramid-like structure. By rushing on ahead, it's possible to quickly go and steal a banshee before an elite is able to get in it. This makes this a bit of a cakewalk, because you're able to just skip the entire next segment, but I decided to go ahead and use it to clear out the area in case there was anything important I'd forgotten about in the next area. Needless to say, I completely wasted my time as there was absolutely nothing important in the next area, just a bunch of corridors and rooms yet again. Boo. Arriving at the bottom of the pyramid, making my way and finally getting the doors open, we finally finish our titular assault on the control room and plug Cortana in. She studies what exactly the ring is, determining that this is indeed some kind of super weapon that the Covenant wants to use, before suddenly becoming very panicked. You see, in the previous level we were informed that Keyes has gone off on an adventure to try and find some sort of weapons cache and that we have lost contact with him. Cortana doesn't do a particularly good job of explaining her worry here, but makes it clear that Keyes is in danger again. She stresses that the Covenant were not aware of something important, and then it's entirely up to the Master Chief to stop something terrible from happening. And with that, he runs off, ready to rescue Keys. Oh, those Covenant fools, they must have known, there must have been signs. Fohammer drops us off in a swamp, which is apparently where Keys and Johnson went. Something is immediately off, as we shortly come across some Covenant who are fleeing, as well as some bodies that are already dead. I suppose if the captain came through here, it's possible that they're just fearing their lives after some elites got killed, but something does seem off. This is further cemented when we enter a structure in this swamp, head down into the basement and see green slime leaking from the ceilings, more dead Covenant bodies, more scared grunts and jackals, and... Well that is a lot of blood. Even stranger is this marine we find who quickly opens fire on us, ranting and raving about something coming to get him that got to the captain already. All evidence points to something else being in this facility, something that the Covenant and humans alike are afraid of. In a room devoid of any human bodies but chock full of weapons on the floor is a little drive containing body cam footage of a marine named Jenkins. We observe as he arrives to the swamp with Johnson, entering the facility and observing the ominous atmosphere going through the same rooms that I have just been through to arrive here, until arriving in this very room. With Johnson and Keys in tow, Jenkins and the other marines enter the room and observe some strange noises and going-ons, before, suddenly, something strikes, surrounding the unit and overwhelming them seemingly killing them quite quickly. It's hard to tell exactly what they are, but they're tiny and clearly not Covenant. The video feed cuts out, presumably as Jenkins himself dies, as we see Johnson and Keyes surrounded by these little critters. Snap back to reality, and Chief is stood in the same room that he just saw, and a door has just opened itself. A wave of these things suddenly enter the room, surrounding us with overwhelming numbers. The large number of assault rifles in this room make taking them down a breeze, especially considering how little damage they actually do, but the longer we stay here, the more and more keep coming. Eventually, the door I came in through opens itself back up and I am able to run back through and backtrack through the facility somewhat, now being chased and attacked by various different formations of these fungus creatures. Some are explicitly fungal and gooey in their appearance. Some are a bit more alien and covenant-esque, and some are even quite human-looking, even holding human weaponry. Whatever these things are, they at least seem very susceptible to bullets, which is good as we finally get our hands on our first shotgun just up ahead, something that tears through these creatures with ease. Before we can leave, we just make our way further into the facility via an elevator that is just coated in covenant blood into the bowels of the ring. Fighting off some more of these creatures and using the destruction they have caused to elevate ourselves to safer platforms and navigate through this area as quickly as possible, I make it to a lift that will actually take us back to the surface. Fortunately, Chief's bulky armor seems to protect him from the same fate as Jenkins, but the same cannot be said for the numerous marines we meet at the top of the lift. As we try to navigate through the swamp to meet up with Fohammer, the lads get picked off pretty quickly by the continuous fungal assault coming our way. Just as all hope starts to seem lost as there is nowhere convenient for Fohammer to land, strange robotic creatures emerge from the facility up ahead and start beaming down the creatures, accompanied by a glowing blue orb of some description. Once Chief and the robots have defeated enough of these guys, he is teleported up to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the blue orb, a robot in and of itself that identifies itself as the Monitor of Installation 04, and refers to itself as 343 Guilty Spark. Someone has released the Flood, and Guilty Spark requires Chief's help to stop it. Someone has released the Flood! What a fantastic deception I lay. The implication that the Covenant were our only foes in this game, to say that our enemy types were limited only to grunts, jackals, elites, and hunters? As you now know, this is not necessarily the case. That previous, ominous level, appropriately titled 343 Guilty Spark, is the series' first introduction to the Flood. 
Those creatures we faced, the ones surrounding keys and sadly killing the second soldier named Jenkins to be featured on this channel, by now you have probably deduced that they are, in fact, the Flood. A separate alien race to the various species that constitute the Covenant, the Flood are more like... Well, zombies. You have the little face hugger type ones we saw forming keys called infection forms who infect. Human, elite, grunt, it doesn't matter. They hop on them, kill them, and eventually turn them into a fully evolved form of a flood creature. The big bulbous ones are known as carrier forms, and they take very little damage to kill, but will soon after explode into their own mini swarm of infection forms. The explosion damages you heavily if you stand near it, making it something you want to keep far away from you for a multitude of reasons. And then finally, the combat forms. These are a bit more varied, as I had pointed out their varying appearances based on which species they've captured. And weapon-wise, they are perhaps the most versatile of all enemies in the game, being able to wield pretty much everything the Chief can wield except for maybe the sniper rifle to my knowledge. They're also very annoyingly resistant to melee attacks so I just wouldn't even bother. While the Covenant tend to fight in units and have some sort of intelligence to their AI, such as was pointed out by grunts running away when their commanders are killed, the Flood are appropriately named as they will continue to run at you relentlessly, like a large tidal wave of fungal zomboids looking to turn you. The one upside is that the conversion process isn't instant, so the dead bodies lying around aren't actually of any threat to us, so these really are more akin to fighting off a generalised zombie horde and doing whatever can be done to keep them at bay, while watching out for what weapons they're carrying or perhaps even disarming them if you're able. The variety that they add is in my opinion fantastic, and while their skill sets are a little less varied and interesting than what is presented by the Covenant, the fact that this game has a whole secret enemy faction they don't reveal until a little over the halfway point is incredible. And let it be known, this is the main enemy from here on out. The Covenant certainly aren't going to let up and stop attacking by any means, but the Flood are the bigger threat by far, as 343 Guilty Spark informed us. And no level makes this any more apparent than our only level against exclusively Flood enemies. You know it, you probably don't love it, I'm talking about the Library. We are near the industry. follow me. Ask any Halo fan what their least favourite level is in any Halo game. Well, I suppose maybe you should specify Bungie Halo games, and there will likely not be a large variety of answers. Some may say the level Truth and Reconciliation that we visited earlier, and others might point to a level in Halo Reach that features a rather extensive space flying segment. Some people may have a few other answers here and there, but generally the majority will always point you back to the same answer. The library is the seventh level out of ten total levels in Halo Combat Evolved, and marks a real turning point for this game. So far we visited a human spaceship and a covenant spaceship, we visited a luscious green valley, a desert, an island, a snowy ravine, and a swamp. And so naturally the next exciting location that we need to visit is a big grey nothing building featuring four repetitive and nondescript floors of exclusively flood enemies. By no means get me wrong, some of the story snippets that we pick up here are absolutely fascinating, if not a bit vague. Earlier Cortana had referred to Halo as being built by something called the Forerunners, and now 343 Guilty Spark is ranting and raving about Halo's purpose and referring to Chief as a Reclaimer. This all ties into the much deeper Halo lore that I won't be addressing much in this video, I'll probably save a lot of that stuff for Halo 2 and 3, but it helps to plant seeds of intrigue for the greater Halo universe. Vague statements from our robot friend about a previous usage of the ring, containment and study of the flood and a showing of some more drones that he refers to as sentinels, continue throughout this whole marathon of a level to keep up interest, which is great because visually this level is a snooze fest. If you're a fan of the colour grey, it may appeal to you, but would you believe me when I say that the two clips you see on screen are from entirely different parts of this level? Now multiply that same in us by 20, and you have the library. I don't think that it's the worst thing ever, but every game has to have a weakest level, and the library makes a very compelling argument. The lore stuff? Fascinating, great, interesting, and curious. The gameplay? It leaves a lot to be desired. Fortunately, once passing through and reaching our objective, an item that 343 Guilty Spark refers to as the Index, and claims to be the key to activating Halo and therefore killing the Flood, we are returned back to the control room safely to begin activation of the ring. After putting the Index in and getting things ready, however, we are rudely interrupted by Cortana. Do you have any idea what that gentleman almost made you do? Perhaps Chief's immediate trust of this robot was misplaced, because Halo is not in fact the solution to defeating the Flood that we were led to believe. Or not directly at least. As it would happen, it kills the Flood by eliminating their primary food source, sentient life. Covenant and human alike would have been annihilated across the galaxy in the blink of an eye should Guilty Spark have gotten his way, and Chief very nearly enabled exactly that. 
Realising now what is at stake, Chief immediately turns his gun against Guilty Spark, rescuing Cortana from the console and getting ready to fight his way off the ring, past not only the Covenant, not only the Flood, but now the Sentinels as well. To quickly talk about fighting Sentinels, well, they fly first of all, and they are very vulnerable to plasma weaponry as a stark contrast to the Flood. You actually start off this level with a shotgun and a plasma pistol, and boy oh boy is the shotgun worthless against them. This level is called Two Betrayals for some reason. It's not worth questioning the only betrayal really is from Guildy Spark, so I have just no idea whom this supposed second betrayal is. And seemingly people don't have any real answers about this out there. Anyway, we start playing an indeterminate number of betrayals by going ahead out of the control room and... And uh... Well this is this is just assault on the control room again, but uh... but but backwards? Uh, I mean we visit a few different rooms this time, as this level focuses on the Banshee instead of the Scorpion, and we get to fly up to new areas, where we run into beams to disable our shields. This is intended to weaken the ring, and helps a little bit to keep the level sort of fresh and gives the purpose of us now betraying Guilty Spark in turn. Hey, maybe that's the second betrayal. But but yeah, as, as a whole, I don't really have a whole lot to say because I already spoke about Assault on the Control Room, and as good as that level is as a whole, doing it again but backwards except this time I'm in a Banshee so it's even quicker is just a bit underwhelming. Nevertheless, we make it to the end as Cortana has been devising a plan to use the Pillar of Autumn's engines to trigger an explosion capable of destroying the ring. To do so, however, we need keys. Or at least his brain implant. She theorises that she may be able to teleport us just this once to near where Keys is located, and so we zip off to whatever newfangled location we may get to explore to find the captain. We arrive on board the Truth and Reconciliation, and... Really, we're doing another level in reverse? Now admittedly, this level does take a pretty big detour when we drop out of the ship and into a canyon down below, fighting the Flood and Covenant while wading through deep water and surrounded from all sides. That's at least a step up from what we were given with the last level, but at best it's only about half the level. Once it's over, we once again use the grav lift to go aboard the ship that we've already been on twice by this point. And yeah, from here on out it's basically the same layout as the first time we were here. Well, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, it, it was a fun enough level the first time around. But at the end of the day, it is just the same level, but with Flood. We power through the numerous enemies and make it back to the top of the hangar which previously led onwards to the prisons. Fortunately for us, we don't have to go to the prisons this time, as Keys is hanging out right here. But dear oh dear, it would seem that Keys has suffered from a mild case of having been taken over by the Flood. Interesting that they've not attempted to turn him into a more typical Flood form, it seems like they're turning him into a much larger and stranger creature that I'm sure is not a worrying sign of things to come in any future installments. So rather than worrying about it, we just reach into what used to be the captain's head and acquire the means to detonate the pillar of autumn, destroying his gigantic flood mass in the process. We leave the room, make our way back out to the hangar and get in the Banshee, setting off to fly to the Pillar of Autumn. After a somewhat amusing cutscene of Chief randomly crashing his Banshee just to look dramatic for no reason, we're treated to yet another worryingly familiar looking level. Same vents, hallways and bridge, but once again with Flood. With Key's activation initiated, Cortana sets the ship to detonate remotely except, uh oh, 343 Guilty Spark has caught wind of our plans and is hiding out in the engine room stopping this from happening whatsoever. This is fortunately where the level takes a huge departure from the first mission of the game, by sending Chief to the engines to set off explosions within vents that we open. So let's just quickly... Mm, 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 eh, eh, mm. All done. The ship is now rumbling and getting ready to blow. One issue, however, we're still on it. So Cortana directs us to the top of the room to an escape route as she calls in Fauxhammer again. Hop in a Warthog and drive through perhaps the most amazing and empowering section of any video game you have ever played. Music blaring as you power through enemies and drive over two kilometres to our meeting point with Fauxhammer. A strange bridge that I guess connects the two halves of this ship? I don't have any clue what this is supposed to be, but it looks visually stunning as Fauxhammer shows up to crash and burn. At this point, Chief and Cortana are now officially alone on Halo. Keys, Guilty Spark and Fauxhammer are all dead. Johnson was last seen surrounded by the Flood, and the Ring is about to detonate at 100 million degrees. I don't know if that's Fahrenheit or Celsius, but either way I do believe it's a little out of the survivable range for most humans, Chief included. Fortunately, Cortana detects that there is in fact one ship left in the Pillar of Autumn's hangar, and so Chief hops into his car and goes full throttle to make his way there just in the nick of time, or actually with several minutes still left in my case, to fly away and watch the ring go bye bye in safety, with all that's left being dust and echoes. Whoever that is. Just dust and echoes. Chief takes off his helmet just off screen as the dynamic duo drift off aimlessly into the stars and the game concludes. 
If the game was played on Legendary, then before taking off there's a little extra piece of cutscene that shows what appears to be Johnson hugging an elite, which is neat and funny, but most certainly non-canon. And trust me, while I chose to play this game on Heroic for this video, this was for the sake of convenience and making it quicker and a bit more enjoyable to play for me. Rest assured, I have finished this and indeed every Halo game in the Master Chief Collection on the Legendary difficulty, and they are mostly incredibly fun, this game included. The only thing I briefly want to touch on before moving on to multiplayer and co-op is to give a sort of shout out to the remastered graphics. I said before that the graphics themselves don't work for me, they do certainly look better, I just think the art style clashes with the theming of the game and looks too busy. In a real less is more situation, but what I do appreciate is the ability to press a singular button to instantly transform the game from looking like this to looking like this. That is awesome and more remasters need to incorporate such a concept where possible so that anyone can play their preferred version of the game. And that is where the single player campaign of Halo Combat Evolved ends, with many aspects of its lore and story being kept relatively vague and not touched upon, which is why I too have kept them vague and not used any squares in this video. But before we go, let's talk about perhaps the even more important part of this game and the series' real claim to fame, the multiplayer. Double kill, triple kill, game over. In a world before multiplayer online gaming, People played together or against each other by huddling on their friend Nathan's sofa and playing games. Be this Mario Kart, GoldenEye or indeed Halo, playing split screen or via connecting multiple consoles to the same network was the way to play games at the time. And for this particular game, it's aged slightly poorly in my opinion. Bearing in mind that I was very young when this game came out, too young to even know what the word Halo meant and certainly too young to be playing video games. So my opinions on it reflect the game in itself as an online multiplayer game via the Master Chief Collection as opposed to what it was like at the time. Now I know for a fact that having grown up more so in a Halo 3 and Halo Reach generation that if this game was even a fraction as fun to play with friends as those games were, that this game was an absolute blast in its prime. But playing the multiplayer now on the Master Chief Collection for me just begs the question as to why I'm not playing one of those two games or Infinite instead. It's fun, don't get me wrong, it's pretty frantic and has a lot of cool maps that would be remastered and remade innumerable times throughout the series, and the general gameplay of versing elites in the campaign is pretty similar to versing another human person in the multiplayer. Grenades are maybe a bit too prevalent and the pistol is still absurdly good, but the game as a whole is a fun time. I just don't think a game like this can hold my or indeed many people's attentions online very much nowadays, and that's a shame. I think most people would prefer to play something newer or older in this arena shooter genre. A newer Halo game would be much more enjoyable for me, while older veterans would still probably prefer playing something like Quake 3, because that's ultimately what this is, it's, it's an arena shooter where you all spawn in on the level with basic weapons and go around either killing people or picking up better weapons until a certain amount of kills or objectives have been reached. The core gameplay of it is great, and it continues to stay great throughout future Halo games, and for Halo C in particular it's really more so a case of the legacy of this multiplayer that makes it noteworthy. Machinima. This is a word that probably spreads fear and nostalgia to many people, and is essentially the basic idea of using a video game as a medium to tell a story and or make jokes to spread to the internet to varying degrees of success. One of the internet's first big long-standing video series was made by a group called Rooster Teeth here in this very game, and it is called Red vs Blue. Without Halo Combat Evolved's multiplayer, this series and that company as a whole, the many many hours of laughs, information that it spread to millions of people, none of that would have existed without this basic and fun multiplayer play a layout. So, while it may not necessarily be for me, I admire and respect what it did for 2001. Now I did also say earlier that there are some exclusive weapons and a vehicle for multiplayer, so let's briefly talk about the first one, which is the Fuel Rod Cannon, a weapon which we saw wielded by grunts and hunters in the campaign, although never wieldable by us, the player. In multiplayer, it is usable, and it is pretty similar to the rocket launcher. It's a little different with an overcharge mechanic, and it more reliably hits through cover, but anything a rocket launcher can do, the Fuel Rod can do just as well, but in green. The flamethrower is way more interesting and unique, as, well I mean, it's a flamethrower and not a rocket launcher. It shoots flames forward, they only cover a short distance but they rack up massive damage quickly to enemies within that distance. It's actually a lot of fun to use but it's pretty rare to come across in my experience and really ineffective outside of punching range. Still, burning things is fun and people are liable to fear the man running at them with a flamethrower if nothing else. And as for the vehicle, we have a warthog with a rocket cannon on the back. The regular warthog has a machine gun, this one has rockets. I'll let you use your imagination to figure out what this vehicle does and all I'll say is that it is exactly as fun and effective as you might imagine. The other part of the multiplayer, and perhaps my favourite bit however, is that the entire single player campaign I told you about, that can be played with a friend. Start to finish, the whole thing can be played and enjoyed as a 100% corporate 
cooperative experience where you try and help each other out to finish the level. Or perhaps it just devolves into shooting each other in the back for fun, trying to ram vehicles where they don't belong and generally causing chaos. And every single aspect of joy that the campaign has to give is amplified by the introduction of a friend, and is truly one of the most basic joys that you can have playing a video game. Halo. It's finished. No. I think we're just getting started. And thus endeth the tale of Halo Combat Evolved for the original Xbox console. It's a nice and short game, which is why I wanted to do it over Mass Effect 3 right away, and its mechanics have aged really well for the most part, with it still feeling incredibly fun to play to this day. But it isn't a game released in this day. It's well over 20 years old by this point, and it's not easy to ignore that at times when playing. Not just graphically, mind you, that much is obviously excusable, but as much as I enjoy the barebones story, it's hard to deny that it leaves a little to be desired. The story and the gameplay as a whole, enjoyable as they may be, are something that I sit here and now and look through the lens of somebody who's played all of the Halo games, and for all of the great parts of this game, it is a product of its time that is overshadowed by its successes in many ways. More weapons, more vehicles, more enemy types, much more juicy lore, more levels, better graphics and sound, a robust and online multiplayer that thrives to this day, cosmetic unlocks for achieving things, more amazing music, new abilities and ways to play, the absolute insanity that comes from Forge and map making, and with the Master Chief Collection mod support for many of these games. Halo Combat Evolved has many of these aspects, and in some ways mod support is actually currently more robust than the other Halo games, but it is hard to ignore that as the series went on, and at least for Bungie's tenure making these games, they just continue to get bigger and better and full of more and more stuff to do, and more and more love and care for the most part. It's great to see a series grow and change, but sometimes it does leave the first game lacking in some areas. Take, for example, the second half of the game as a whole, with the final three levels all reusing various aspects of levels that came before them. They had new spins on those locations, sure, and I don't blame a game for being limited by the technology of its time, but it can be a slightly lacklustre feeling part of a game that had such strong opening levels to its name to sort of start fizzling out, although maybe it does more than make up for that in the moment you get in that Warthog for the final drive which is beyond excellent. Overall, it's not my favourite Halo game by far. I may even go as far to say that it is Bungie's weakest offering in the series, but it is still an excellent game in its own right, and lay the groundwork for the future of this series that, with a few hiccups here and there, is still going strong to this day. Following this game, Halo would rise to the top of the world and stay there for a decade at least, and I can honestly say that by 2001 standards, it's not hard to see why this game was so beloved. And that legacy is really why I think Halo is legendary, because not only is this first game such a strong and confident opening, but the series would go to bigger and better places next time.